Watch out for the dust when he puts his reverse thrusters on. Watch out for the dust when he puts his reverse thrusters on. I'm Andy Bloomfield. I'm a volunteer at Brooklands and here we are in Brooklands in the Vickers, what we call the Vickers Aircraft Park. So today we're going to discuss an aeroplane called BAC 111. BAC, British Aircraft Corporation. This is, uh, this is the last one that was uh, designed here and partly built here. So you need to go back in history a bit. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, there was 26 aircraft companies all working away and then suddenly all came stopped. So the government realised they needed to get them into to do two groups to, to, so they can maximise the produ production lines. So it took them until about 1960 to do that. And then they produced two companies called BAC, British Aircraft Corporation, and Hawker Sidley Aviation. Uh, uh, BAC formed with Vickers, which was based here, Bristol, uh, the English Electric and Huntings. Hawker Sidley was uh, de Havilland's, Avro's and a few others, which are kind of Hawkers of course. So that's how it was, and I, I, I started, I was a Hawker man, not, not, a, not, a, not a BAC man. So this was the enemy when I started. And this is, what, this is the aircraft park we have around, around behind us. We have. Uh, if you look closely, you've got over the back there in the silver aeroplane, you'll see the Viking, which is basically came out of the, Vel the uh, Wellington bomber in the Second World War. And then beside it was something called the Varsity, which was a, uh, a military version of it for um, navigation and bomb aiming. And then later on, next to it, the British Air Ferry, that was the Viscount, the most successful civil airliner. They built 444 of those aeroplanes, very, very successful. And the, one of the main reasons is that they've gone, finally gone from pure um, piston engines to a turboprop. A turboprop is a jet engine with a propeller on the top. You can, I won't go into the ins and outs of what that all means, but it's a very efficient aeroplane. And that was, that, that was sort of a late, late 40s that started. And then uh, and in the late 50s, they wanted something to replace it, and they produced the Vanguard in the late 50s. To, again, with turboprops, getting slightly bigger and bigger. And then uh, after that, they produced, they looked around, what should we do now? And we have the, the VC-10, which is a very famous aeroplane. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the whole history of the industry is rather, rather sad in some respects. The, if you go back, the Vanguard was, had some engine issues and by the time it got, actually went in service, the jets have arrived. And although the uh, Vanguard was probably very efficient, time is, rules everything. So it, it actually didn't sell. In, instead, instead of 444, they made 44. Although in the end, they were used mainly as freighters 
because you don't care about time when you're a freighter. You, f you fly overnight. Uh, the, the minister wanted some nuclear armed four engine jet bombers called, uh, uh, called the V bombers, of which the Valiant, this, which made by Vickers here, was the first one. Uh, the other two, of course, was the Avro Vulcan and the Hanley Page Victor. They made, they made over a hundred Valiants here at Weybridge. Um, very successful, but they were built as high altitude bombers. Unfortunately, once the uh, SAM missiles could reach high altitude, they had to fly very low. Unfortunately, the aeroplane wasn't designed for that and had a lot of uh, fatigue problems. But, um, but uh, this is the front, we have a front fuselage in, this, uh, in the factory here. Now, what they also wanted, they wanted to have a strategic transport in support of the V-bombers. So the miniature supply put a contract on Vickers to produce an aeroplane of that size, and which became known as the V-1000. And this is quite an important uh, project because we also, they could see the need to produce a 100-seat civil aircraft of the same sort of size. So original, the original design of the V-1000 was going to be based on the Valiant, um, and also, but also they wanted to have a civil version for transatlantic use. So, but that then became the civil version, would have been called the VC-7, 100-seater, a six abreast transatlantic aeroplane. Unfortunately, in 1955, the, uh, the Ministry of Supply cancelled the contract because, as usual, the costs were running up, there was delays, and also the, the requirement for an aeroplane that was beginning to wane based on other things that were going on in the background. So they cancelled it, which, uh, and despite the prototype being 80% finished at Wisley, uh, that was it. And uh, it was always thought that, um, Sir George Edwards always said, this was a major step back in the British industry. And it was just one of the industry's what-ifs what effort had carried on, it would have been quite an amazing aeroplane. So it was all based on the Valiant. Finally we turned to the Vickers VC-10, very famous aeroplane. In fact, probably one of the most beautiful aeroplanes, that beautiful tail plane. A rear four-engine, rear-engined aeroplane. Uh, this was uh, designed and built, it came out of a requirement to uh, that the BOAC wanted to have aeroplanes that could fly in, into short, shortened runways in high, hot and high places in Africa and the Far East. And this would, so this aeroplane was fitted with the high lift devices so that you could take off and land on very, on shorter runways. It has, uh, what, has what we call the leading edge slats where the slats move out to extend the, sh in the wing. Well, 111 didn't have that. In the evolution of the African Airways, the, and they all, and of course it's in competition with the with the Boeing 707, which couldn't land at those airports, uh, the hot and high airports, short runways. So what happened? Of course, they lengthened the runways. So the uh, that the advantage of VC-10 then disappeared. So it was finally flying on the major routes from London to New York. Unfortunately, because it was built for a slightly different spe specification than the 707, it wasn't as efficient as the 707, but because of the rear engine, it was much more popular because of the, uh, the front end, it was very quiet. Much more popular aeroplane than the Boeing 707. Unfortunately, because of that, they, they only ever built 54 of them here at Brooklands, so which is rather unfortunate. Uh, and you probably remember, some of them then got modified for, as a tanker for the RAF. And that's why they spent a lot of time in the end. But here we are with the BAC-111. And again, because in that turbulent period, the um, BAC was going to take on the new military aircraft called the TSR-2, which got cancelled. And of course it put BAC in a bit of a problem financially, but eventually they, they made 244 BAC 111s, which sort of kept the company going. So that's the sort of quick history of uh, of the, uh, the the Vickers aircraft park. So although it's Vickers, and the history of this aeroplane. So Huntings 
uh, if you go back to the middle 50s, the, the French produced an aeroplane called the Caravelle, which was a rear-engined, twin-engined, rear-engined aeroplane, the first one of its type. And Huntings, they looked to say, ah, OK, they started designing a similar-looking aeroplane for, for about 30 seats, called the H107. So by the time the BAC, uh, the BAC was uh, started, the uh, Vickers were also looking at, uh, they'd already moved on from the VC-10, and they're looking at a VC-11, which was a cut-down version of the VC-10, four-engine version. And eventually BAC looked at them together, and they looked at market research, and they realised that 30 seats wasn't enough, and the VC-11 was too big. So they eventually came down to an 89-seater, uh, aeroplane and it became the BAC 111. Now with that, uh, with the uh, uh, civil airliners, part, part of the success of an aeroplane like the Viscount depends on the engine. So you need an engine that goes with the aeroplane. Uh, the original uh, uh, design or engine for the 111 was, was going to be the same as the Hawker Siddeley Trident, which is the trijet which BEA were flying. And they were all both going to use something called the Midway, which was the one the TSR2 was going to fly with. Unfortunately, the TSR2 got cancelled, so did the engine. So they had to revert to a smaller, slightly less powerful engine called the Spey, which was, became a very popular engine on lots of different aeroplanes. So this aeroplane and the Trident both flew with the Spey and unfortunately became a bit of a kill his heels for both aeroplanes, which we'll come to later. The aircraft was launched in 1960 with an order for 10 from British United Airways. And by the time the first flight came, there was orders flooding in from America for Mohawk and Braniff. So the order book was looking very, very good. The first flight at Hearn was, was on 20th of August, 1963. We're just coming up to the anniversary now and uh, everything went fine. And then, uh, so, and probably had a, oh, probably nearly a year advanced in front of the American uh, DC, uh, McDonnell Douglas DC-9. So we were well, well ahead and in good shape. Uh, unfortunately, in, in October that year, the, uh, the prototype crashed in a, in, a, in a place called Cricklade in Salisbury Plain. Something called deep stall or super stall happened, which wasn't fully understood at the time. But um, just like the comet, we found out what was happening, what went wrong, and we told the world. They all said, thank you very much. And uh, they modded their airplanes accordingly, and we had to do the same. What happened? Well, the deep stall, basically, if you look at the airplane, you have a rear engine airplane, and therefore, when you stall, when you stall, you're basically running out of air. You're either going too slow or you're going too high, and the air's too thin. And basically, if you slow down, eventually the tail, because it's tail heavy, the air plant's tilting backwards, backwards and backwards. And then you start, eventually you'll start going down. And you will go down very fast, if you're not, very quickly. And basically, the air, the wings will blank the air going into the engines, and into the elevators, which are the control at the top of the, uh, the tail. And that's what happened. Uh, and they, they, they you, do, you always do stall tests, you do it, well, they were done at 15,000 feet, something like that, which is what you do, you don't do it low down, just in case it goes wrong. But something happened and it went into this super stall situation very quickly and they just couldn't get out of it. So unfortunately, seven people died in the accident, two very experienced test pilots as well. And that was a real shock to the whole company. So they looked, they got all the recorders out, they realised what had happened. And uh, they, they realised they needed to, um, there was modif well, they realised the uh, elevator, the elevators weren't powerful enough, which didn't help. So they put powered controls onto the elevators. They needed to change the profile of the leading edge so that when you stall, you get a sort of nose down uh, effect rather than anything else. And uh, also they had to, before they could get, go into production, they had to fit a, a stick shaker and a stick pusher, as it's called. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to the matter. Well, if it's a stick shaker, and you look, if you look on the side of the aeroplane, 
it's, it, it's to this side and to the other. They're what we would call the uh, angle of attack or the ADDs as they call them. And they, they move depend where the air, where, what the angle, or give you the angle of the aeroplane to which way the air is going, which is quite an important thing you need to know. And that those things will then detect whether you're, you're flying at not a very good angle and they will then, with an automatic system, will put the stick shaker on. Basically the stick shaker comes first, we can demonstrate that inside, and then if you ignore that, then the pusher will come in, which is a pneumatic ram, will just push the stick forward. All the uh, UK registered aeroplanes, like the VC-10 and the Trident, all had that fitted uh, to, to, make, to ensure that the, the aircraft was safe. Now, the, first, the first aircraft the, the, they built, well, after they've, uh, the, they resurrected the, the production line and got the production going, that was called the 200 series. And then the company in 1967 wanted to uh, have a much more powerful, longer range aeroplane called the 300 stroke 400. The 400 was really referred to as the American version with American equipment in. So they needed to have another test aeroplane and they, they nominate, nominated the 53rd 111, which was uh, Golf, Alpha, Sierra, Yankee, Delta, which we we, we, refer to, we, we refer to him as a him, it's Sid. It's called Sid. So this was the test aeroplane from then on for, the, for that series. The only, any new aeroplane or variant has to be tested and shown to be safe to the authorities before you can get your certificate of an aviation to fly. Once you've got that, then you can fly it, you can sell it. And then about a couple of years later in 1970, uh, BEA wanted a longer aeroplane. So instead of the 89-seater, they wanted the 119-seater. Although in their case, it was probably in two classes, uh, less than 119. So what they did, like a lot of prototypes, they cut it in two places, cut it after the wing and after the, the cockpit, and made it longer into the 500 series. And that's, that's what's BA, and that was what was flying then. And then uh, a couple of years later, they wanted another version called the 475. They were looking at um, uh, looking at uh, unpaved runways in South America, so you could land on unpaved runways. But to do that, you need a low pressure tyres and a lot of uh, you need protection on the leading edge of the wing and behind the wheels to stop you damaging the whole fuselage. Unfortunately, they didn't sell too many of them. But again, this aircraft was modified to do that job. You can see that because underneath, you can see a bulge uh, where, the, uh, the, where the low pressure tires were used. They're not, they're not low lever, not low pressure tires anymore, but the bulge is still there. That was, that was built for that. The, and then later on, they had another, they looked at a, a, a super, quick takeoff version for the Japanese market called the 670 but uh, unfortunately the Japanese didn't buy it and uh, that didn't go anywhere but what we'll do we'll go inside and this was one of the beauties of this airplane it was built and uh, unlike the VC-10 it was built for world, worldwide use therefore it was basically autonomous and at the back of the engine up, up back of the bottom of the tail you'll see a big look like a dustbin but that's that's the auxiliary power unit which all airliners have got, which uh, provides electrical power and air conditioning on the ground, and the air is used to start the engines, like most, most airliners these days. So, so, and of course it's got, and you will now see, it has its own, it doesn't need any stairs from the ground support, it has its own stairs, so we'll just go through that now, we'll just show you. So basically, I know you do, you pull that down. Ooh. Now this was a very much of an American idea. It has stairs at the back, stairs at the front, so you can turn around an airplane very, very quickly. So you basically put the people out the front and bring them up the back. 
So some of the American aeroplane were doing like up to about eight different segments in one day, which is quite a lot to do. But you have to do that. You have to make sure the brakes are cold before you start again. Right. So the back blocks is on this aeroplane that are always in a very strong position. This is, uh, out, unfortunately it's outside the pressurised area so you wouldn't be sitting there flying along. So here we are inside the uh, cabin. Now when it started it would have been full of test gear. You're testing the, uh, you're testing the aeroplane, measuring all various sorts of things. You're also measuring what the en engine's doing. So it would have been full of, well, these seats wouldn't have been here. And then once it finished all that, all the testing work, it, they then used it as a taxi to transfer uh, engineers and people from uh, different sites here uh, and in Bristol to on the Concorde programs or on the uh, Tornado programs into Europe. They'll be used, they'll be used to take that, which is why you'll find these seats are very nice and comfortable and lots of leg room. Uh, the blue ones at the back are actually not the original ones that were here because the original ones, the plastic had just about given up. We have up up above here is a sort of a is a sort of story of the 111 as as I've already described about the accident and the, the people who died in the accident. Mike Lithgow was famous; uh, he held the world speed record. Uh, at one stage, not in a 111, but in a Swift. Uh, so it was rather sad, and this is sort of what happened. And then what did they do about it? And uh, the aeroplane was built, and then the aeroplane was built in various places, Herm, Weybridge, Luton. Luton is where Huntings was, but they part of they then closed in the mid 60s, and lots of work was moved here. And uh, basically, Oh, quick variants, the, the initial thrust on the engine was about 10,000 pounds, then eventually it went up to about 12, 12 and a half, something like that. The, uh, the engines, again, one of the Achilles here was, of course, it, they didn't have the engine they would have liked. Uh, in, compared with the, com the competition in America, which was using the uh, Pratt & Whitney JT-8D, they, um, they just run out of puff in the end. And then, although there was an opportunity on the very early American aeroplanes to change the engine, the, en the decision was made not to do that, I assume for financial reasons. So unfortunately that became a bit of a negative on the whole thing. And eventually, the, these uh, people who live, who know these well, VC-10 and the 111 will know these are very noisy aeroplanes, but of course aircraft were very noisy in those days. So eventually the noise regulations started coming in. So they had to start fitting hush kits, which are actually fitted on this aeroplane. These are the stage two hush kits. But then the uh, regulations got more strict. So they had a stage three hush kit, but they became so expensive that they never, it never went into production. So eventually the, um, in the early, uh, about 2003, the aircraft got banned from Europe because it was just too noisy. Unfortunately, it was used elsewhere. Um, the last aeroplane to fly was a couple of years ago. Uh, as a, a radar test bed in America. And you can you basically put a radar on the front nose and then you can have the displays in here for the technicians to have a look at, etc. Yeah, a feature on the aeroplane we, we like to show is that uh, when this aeroplane was built in the 1960s, then if the aeroplane ever filled in with smoke and you have to get out quickly when it's on the ground, of course, you would come along with your eyes closed and feel along here and you'd, only, you'd come to four studs in the hat rack there, which would tell you where the door was, emergency exits, overwing exits. But then in, later on in the 1970s, 80s, there was a couple of accidents and highlighted that What's important is that you don't, you want to hit the deck when the, 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 the smoke down is, is, is uh, on the ground level is much thinner than it is up high. So what they did was they introduced the floor lighting, which is standard thing on all aeroplanes these days. The lights along the edge and the red lights here show you where your exit is. So if you have to get out quickly, you crawl along the floor, find where the red lights sit and that shows you where the exits are. Thank you. 
we come into this bit here. This is, uh, we've got a mixture, this is a lot of memorabilia of what uh, different, uh, from different people, different aeroplanes. Um, we have uh, always a bit of fun in 1970. There was an airline called Court Lines. Very uh, pastel coloured aeroplanes, pinks, greens, orange from Luton. But in the early 70s, the oil crisis came in, so they went to the wall. So that didn't, they didn't last too long. So um, there's a few other aeroplanes here. Um, then we've got some aircraft stuff. This is, sort of, this is what the batteries looked like in those days. And um, getting into the whole, this is attached to the engine, constant speed drive system. Um, it's very technical that is, so I won't go into that. Um, this is what I was talking about, the elevator's got modified with a power control unit and they had to fit two of them into the tail uh, when the, when, after the crash to make sure that they had enough power, the pilots had enough power to um, move the elevators. There's a few other actuators and the contactors and various bits and pieces. We have a little bit of uh, uh, technology shows you how technology's changed. Uh, it's a typical uh, wall, a lot of plastics and things like carbon fibre tubing, very, very light, very strong. We have, this is you know, floor panels. Yeah, you can put your feet on it. It's not metal. Again, you're looking for lightweight all the time. Now over here, what after the accident here we now we have a nice airplane which we always demonstrate to people who are interested in the whole deep stall thing so if you imagine you deep stall i mean the one that crashed was coming down at about ten thousand feet a minute which is quite incredible when you think about it it would have been coming down like that so you can see the wind so the angle of attack the wings are blocking, blocking the air to the engines and to the tail plane uh, and uh, so what they did in, initially to make sure that they, in, when they were started doing, needed to do the high, what we call the high risk testing, like the stalling, they said, well, we'll have to fit a parachute at the back. So outside there's a structure which they fitted to the back of the aeroplane. And they, you can see here a picture. There's a structure sticking out the back and it would have a parachute in it. Basically, if, you, if the pilot thought he was in a deep stall situation, then he would uh, eject the parachute out the back. And the, basically, the parachute, as the airplane comes down, it will just lift the tail up, the parachute, lift the tail up, put the nose down, and you'll get your speed up. And so this is what was fitted until they had, they put in all the automatic systems. So, um, Unfortunately, there was an incident where one of the pilots thought he had stalled the aeroplane and he um, ejected the parachute. But it looks like he didn't, actually didn't do that. And the whole idea was you eject the parachute once you're safe. But the parachute wasn't ejected and he, ha he landed up landing on Salisbury Plain. Not many miles from the crash site, but managed to, they managed to recover the aeroplane and, and, and repair it, put it back on. On, on test. Um, so when you're on this aeroplane on discussions, um, here you'll see the, uh, there's a memorial down in Chiclade to the uh, crash site, which I went to a few years ago. And in the discussion, if you get in discussion with people, they may, if they live around here, they will probably remember the, the Staines crash of the Trident. They remember that. And you can you get into the whole less deep stall, what happened to that aeroplane. And then that moves nicely onto black boxes. So we have a nice history of black boxes. Uh, it's sort of a, it's what we, it's sort of a, uh, get a, give an idea of the history of black boxes. I think, we think black boxes came about from the Second World War when black boxes are like magical, secret, whatever. So you start off with something like this, <laughs> like a Sputnik. Heat proof, shock proof, waterproof. And you land up with a, 
a wire, a wire recorder. You just put a little dents on the wire. You might have only about five bits of information on there. Uh, up, then you've got this, the one fitted on this airplane, which is like a metal foil. A lot more information. And then uh, in the 19, up to about 1970, you, you had a flight data recorder, which would tell you what, what happened, but you couldn't always tell why, because you didn't know what the pilots were doing. So they introduced the cockpit voice recorder. So if you see in any of the programs these days, You'll, you'll, you'll hear them, they'll take uh, data from the, you'll hear, might hear the cockpit voice recorder. You put the two together and you should find out what happened and you try and make sure it doesn't happen again. But as we know, the, we've, there's still an aeroplane we can't find, so they can't even find the black box, let alone the aeroplane. So they realised that originally they, the, the recorders would have a little uh, locator beacon on the back which would pulse in away with a battery which lasted a month, but I think that's now been increased to um, make it last much longer. Now any new aeroplane will probably have one of these, an escape hatch. This has got an escape hatch, like the Concorde have one and the VC-10 have one. Basically the door, there's a cargo door below there which has got explosive bolts on it. So you needed to get out, you blow the doors off as they, as they said in the film, and you put your parachute on, open the hatch and you go down the chute. And again, you have to be very clear, you need to be out of the way of the wing and the engines, otherwise you'll, you'll be hitting things. So uh, we believe the door was blown off on the crash, and, but certainly nobody tried to get out. We, we believe that's what happened. Um, moving down here, this is the sort of test gear you would have seen well, the aeroplane, this is, a, this is um, they would have a, their own crash recorder there, recording data. Uh, this is sort of uh, a lot of the uh, transducers used for measuring. You're looking at air pressures on the wings and this is of a calibration thing. You know, calibrate things before you start, things like that. And then you'd have a big lot of displays like this. So you'll be a flight test engineer sitting there. Again, then we get this is sort of 1960s, 70s, analog stuff. Taking readings. Can you imagine when the aircraft goes from stall test and a lot of things are happening where you want. So what you can do, you can fit a camera. See the camera there. You can fit a camera and play it back later. But this is sort of the um, Aircraft, this is what it used to look like in 1965, and then they wanted to have the 500, they converted, they cut it in two places, extended by 162 inches, or if you want to know, 4.1 metres, and then uh, that's, so here you have the uh, 500 series, longer compared with the 400 series. And then, as I said, they made it small again into the 475. And then, as we said, the 670. So when they'd finished all that, it then started doing various um, system testing. And one of them was um, in support of the Airbus program, some advanced flight control test equipment. And in here is a 40-year-old digital computer in there, a breadboard, which obviously very early days and basically looking at how computer, computer control or controls the aeroplane and make it safer. Um, the other thing you may have noticed, there was a sign on the top, fly by light technology, or written on the fuselage. Uh, that was because they, uh, they did some very early um, fibre optic work. If you forget fibre optics are, today is, you know, which we used all the time on the, on your, on your, um, Broadband and all that sort of stuff, but you had to learn. So they used it. They used it just to signal stuff. It signaled some uh, non-essential spoilers in the wings. They used it to test out uh, to do that. In the 70s, uh, there was an agreement with in Romania to build under contract some BAC 111s for Terum, the uh, Romanian airline. So there was a big idea they could probably build tins of aeroplanes, fantastic, etc, etc. And some of the early stuff, if you look down here, 
So basically, the early stuff, I think we, the, the, probably the fuselage was built in Hearn and then sent over to Romania and they then finished it off. And the, the airplane was put into what was the Super Guppy. This was uh, the same sort of airplane that was used to transport the Airbus parts, uh, the wings from Chester to Toulouse or from all the other parts. And so this was used and so would swallow up the, uh, the aeroplane. That's what that picture is showing. Unfortunately, the uh, politics and everything changed and eventually they, they only ever built nine aeroplanes. Now this aeroplane would have had, we've got, we have one galley this one's got a toilet at the back, so they may have had a toilet at the front. They'd be having two classes, two galleys. So um, obviously heating the food up, cups of tea, etc., etc. <coughs> now they had stairs at the front, so where were the stairs at the front? Then not not all the aeroplanes had the stairs at the front because if you if you were like today, if you're flying into um, a major airport, you just come up against a pier and. The walkway comes in and locks you against the door. So, so this airplane, you just open the door. We have a little gas lock there to stop the wind bashing the door. And uh, you think, well, where's you think, well, where's the uh, where's the stairs? And then, and then out of nowhere arrives the stairs. Very clever. Hydraulically driven. And you just, you just wait for gravity. We have a we've we have a cup we have a, um, a small DC hydraulic pump which we use to operate the stairs, both stairs now. So that basically you come in the back of the aeroplane and you go out the front. You have a nice flow of people, etc. etc. Finally we have the cockpit. Here we have is, uh, give people an idea what the cockpit looks like today. What it looked like, uh, 1960s technology, the VC-10 and the Concorde, very similar. And uh, then over here we have, although even this picture is like 40 years old, this is what an Airbus 320 would look like. You can see the big difference. The big difference is, of course, all Airbuses have got side sticks. There's no control column. So, you, so when you're sitting in the right seat, you want your right hand, and when you're in the left seat, you use the left hand. Um, this is, there's two schools of thought of that. But <laughs> Basically, the, the, all the information's in the same places as the, this one. Each pilot's got his own displays. Uh, all the switches are in the roof, and all the radios are down here. And they've got two to control you put all your data in your waypoints etc a lot more automation and of course a lot more they've got six screens these days so um, a lot different but uh, that's what basically what the airbus looks like most airplanes will look like although other than airbuses they will have control columns uh, the interesting thing is that on an airbus if you move that controller that one doesn't move Whereas conventional aeroplanes with control columns, they both move together. So, um, like all cockpits, they're not, they don't need to be very good. It's um, what I refer to as, it's just like a kitchen. It doesn't have to be big. It's, keep it small. Everything's at your fingertips. This is what cockpit's all about. You'd have your headset on. Talk to whoever. So, um, usually the pilots have got their own They've got their own oxygen masks because they, uh, they need to put them on first if there's any, any incident. Yeah, so these basically, these up here, these were, these were testing purposes. This was part of the fibre optic work that was done, just a simple switch. Uh, fibre light, uh, when you hear the word uh, fibre wire, that normally refers to computer driven system using copper wire. Fly by light means it's instead of using wire, you're using fibre optics, which are not prone to uh, electromagnetic interference. But you can't use fibre optics everywhere. This, these incidents in uh, these extra instruments put in because to, to allow the airplane to come and land here, 
you need to land as slow as possible. And to do that, you need to get the angle of the airplane correct so you can slow down. So you needed something more accurate that was on, that was on the airplane. So that was put in for landing purposes. So as you can see, the radio is here. There's an autopilot here. These are the throttles. There's the throttles backwards and forwards. These are the thrust reversers when you land, if you need to. That's there. These are all the trim. The elevator trim, the rudder, aileron trims, etc. Uh, each pilot's got his own display. Uh, artificial horizon shows you whether you're upside down or not, how fast you are, how slow you are, the rate of climb, and of course the compass. And you've got the, all sorts of landing indicators when your instrument landing system is working. Uh, the 111, it well, did take, um, did do some uh, advanced um, automatic landings in fog. The uh, the roof panel was where all the switches are, all the different systems. You've got the electrical system, you look at the volts and amps frequency, you've got the engine start system, you've got the fuel system, the fuel, uh, you've got the uh, pressurization system, and um, you've got various other switches. And then you've got these interesting um, dual knobs, this is the external lights which they use. Um, interesting. Uh, if you have military airplanes, you'll find that uh, fighters, all the switches will have a certain different shaped knob so they can actually detect which is which without actually looking at it. So they'll know which is the fuel switch or whatever. Now what I'm to show you, um, this would be a bit, a bit like the uh, floor lighting. This would be automatic. So the sensors on the side of the airplane do detect the angle of the airplane. So once you get to a certain point, then you'll get the stick shaker. <laughs> And then the automatic systems would detect it and shake the stick and then, and then if it goes any further then you'll get an automatic ram pneumatic ram will stick that push that stick forward so you get the nose down once you get your nose down you get the speed up and you're back in control again um, other features on this airplane we have again will be automatic you'll get fire warning systems like that and you then pull the stick out, turn it to put the fire extinguishers on. One, you've got two cho two goes at it. That's the fire extinguisher, one for each engine and one for the auxiliary power unit. Again, will be automatic. Uh, you've got you've got three green lights, which is, which is the you need them when you're landing. That tells you the three undercarriages, the legs are down, the wheels are down. And if you ever try and move this handle up, which you, you can never do, but as soon as you try and touch it, a little warning will come up, you'll probably get a horn will tell you, leave it alone. You can never ever push the lever up on the ground. There's a detent in there, stops it happening. Today, today's philosophy is that it's what called a dark cockpit. So there'll be no lights up there, you know, if everything's fine, which is uh, no news is good news. Obviously in the middle you've got in the engine stuff's in the middle, and then the hydraulics is here. First, in the evolution of aeroplanes, the, you'll notice there's probably about, I don't know, about 100 of these, 100 of these uh, warning lights, or red and amber, uh, they're, I don't know, about 50 to 100, and uh, you basically, basically press them to test the bulbs. And uh, the first thing that really happened was to centralise that into one place down here, called the central warning system, like you see today. That's one of the first things they did. And then eventually the electronic displays came in and then finally you got this whole six screens display with lots of information, lots of system information and, um, and then basically tell you what to do after different faults. It's all of the work I was doing lots of is these things here behind you. You, you see down there a whole line of circuit breakers over there. And then behind, we come around the other side, around here. There's another bank over there, and there's a whole load in here. They're all the circuit breakers for all the equipment. That's what I was, uh, did lots of my design on those. This is the 111, the BAC 111. Very successful aeroplane. Um, probably saved, uh, saved BAC from going broke. 
but it's just a rather a shame that um, in the end it uh, it could have done a lot better if they changed the engine, but whatever politics got involved. And the other thing, of course, once the Americans, the uh, the the depth, the, the we were in, in front of the Americans at the very beginning, but by the time we took our the first flight, we were, we were only months behind, and they realised they needed to stretch the aeroplanes, so they stretched the aeroplanes very quickly, and we were a bit slow in producing the 500, and of course the uh, aer the uh, American engine could be grow a bit better than our one, so and eventually, of course, it got too noisy. Um, I'll just have a quick look out outside. Um, this is the uh, stall recovery parachute installation we spoke about earlier. This would be fitted to the back of the aeroplane when they, when they were doing all the stall tests before the, uh, before the automatic systems came in, were fitted. Uh, I suspect this one's a uh, this is a very late picture, which I suspect they were probably doing the testing without the without the stall recovery system fitted, the automatic systems, because they probably wanted to optimise, make sure that where the stall was it hasn't really changed from previously. That's probably why it was fitted then. But then when this is this is the later one, so this is quite later on in uh, in the production lines. Uh, but here you can see the picture of the way the airflow works and then you fit the parachute and whoop, up it goes. There's a fair old weight on the back and the parachute would go in there. So you can see at the back on the engine, you can see that was the husk kit. That, the, bit, the, bit, the metal bit at the back, that's the husk kit. This is the... Uh, the reverse thrust mechanism, which redirects the thrust forward to slow you down. Um, you'll, there's a few of these. There's hatches for uh, the, if there was a toilet at the back, you, or water. That's uh, for putting the water in, etc., etc. Yeah, it's three three flaps each side and three spoilers, or two spoilers and ground spoiler on the top. Uh, they didn't have a leading edge, uh, didn't have leading edge slats like the VC-10. Leading edge slats for, were used to help uh, for fast takeoff and landing. But uh, this airplane didn't need it. We have a, we've, we have, we've deployed the landing lights at the moment as it's half turn. They would normally be flush. They're normally flush and they'd come down like that. We wouldn't dare put the power on, they take about 600 watts, they do. <laughs> uh, again, you've got different panels. These are probably fitted for, I don't know, maybe for the galley, another galley or something here. They've got different panels here. You show you all sorts of uh, air inlets for the pressurisation system, of all sorts of things going on, valves, etc. Um, all aeroplanes would have one of these, or certainly airlines would have standard. This is a standard three phase aircraft, three phase, 200 volts, 400 cycles connector. I suspect the big, I think the big ones have probably got two of them. <laughs> We've got the uh, nose landing light out there. These are the pitot tubes, as they call them. They uh, measure the uh, speed and the speed of the aeroplane. There's probably there's three of them. There's one there, one there, one the other side. And you'll get the uh, metal up there, what we call the static. Static sensors, they'll give you the, uh, the height, height sensors. Uh, this would be the sort of water, is this the water one I think it is? Yes, yeah, where the water goes in, or you drain it, etc. 
So you see this out, because it's a low wing aeroplane, it, all the maintenance is fairly, it's all low down, it's easy to get out. Nice. Um, this will be the forward hold. So um, these are the bolts which would be explosive. You'd blow those bolts and the whole door will be flying off. So if you ever need to get out. Uh, fuel, again, nice, low down. Put your fill, you're gonna fill in there. Pressure refueling. And uh, you'll have a little intercom. And you'll talk to the crew. You plug, plug in, talk to the crew. There's one at the front as well. And the refuel panel, you'll work here. And you just set up what you want. Uh, the the, the uh, this this 400 series uh, had the extra centre tank put on, which is why I had the extra range. Where the original 200 series didn't have that. Uh, one of the uh, things they added later on. Uh, 